Fresh facts have revealed the scope of the crisis in Nigeria's aviation sector. Only 38 out of 98 airplanes are active. Will it get worse before it gets better? A federal government minister is disagreeing with the federal government. Nigeria's telecommunications minister thinks it is a bad idea to introduce a new telecoms tax. So we'll look at this on the program today. And as usual, we have in-depth analysis of the headlines contained in today's national dailies. It's a beautiful, beautiful Wednesday morning. We're back with The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. My name is Kofi Bartels. And of course, so we have a bumper-packed program for you with information, discussions, and interesting analysis lined up to give you a very good start to your day. And this is the place to be, Plus TV Africa. You get it better nowhere else. Once again, you're welcome. We have a top-trending segment uh, to begin with. And of course, as we go on, we'll get to the other uh, things. We earlier advertised them. And what we do on this segment is to basically look at what is generating conversation and debate on the social space, and we bring it on television. Now, we start with what's going on in Oyo State uh, where the judiciary staff in Oyo State um, on Tuesday complied with the sit-at-home directive issued uh, by the Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria, Jusun for short. That's what they called. Now, why is why, why is Jusun on strike? Now, Jusun is on strike because of um, the delay in the payment of their July salary is an interesting one. The delay in the payment of their July uh, salary. The Oyo State uh, Jusun Public Relations Officer, Mr. Obafunsho, Obafunsho rather, Okulaja, uh, told the news agency of Nigeria that uh, the decision for the action was... Uh, resolved after the union's congress held on friday so they had a congress and a meeting held on friday and then this led uh, to the union going on a strike he said the workers had not received their july salary while all the government agencies um were were paid on july 25 all right while all the government agencies were paid on july 25 that's um, before the end of the month um these workers had not received their salary. Of course, um, uh, some would say it's, uh, it's early days yet. It's not uh, um, yet uh, the middle of the month. So maybe, uh, maybe they should uh, they should come down and wait, you know, for uh, uh, for some time before they they go on strike. But no, they are not waiting. They actually feel that um, uh, it's 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 time for the government to pay them. All right. So they are on strike. And this will mean that the, the, the courts in, in, in Oyo State will be, um, will be on hold because, of course, the judiciary workers are the ones that, um, that make the courts tick. All right, judiciary staff, you know, the clerks and all that. If you want to file your case, you know, and everything, you have to go through them to make sure everything is on, on point before you proceed to the court. But sometimes it's possible for the courts to have skeletal um, uh, uh, services. So let's see if the courts in Oyo State will be able to hold. Yeah, this is what he said, quote, our members do not have money to come to work. Our members do not have money uh, to come to work. So we directed them to sit at home. Uh, Jason is yet to receive the July salary in the state. And this delay in salary payment has been like since December 2021. So it's probably has been on and off uh, since last year. And they probably have had enough. And they said, now, if you don't go on strike, this will not go pay also. And they have um, they have gone on strike. This, of course, is uh, uh, the the responsibility of the state government. This is or your state judiciary. Okay, so it's not about the federal government. Just to be clear, um, he said that quote: "We call on the state government to put its uh, put us on the priority list as a third arm of government. Uh, if the executive and legislative arms are given priority." Then the judiciary should also be given priority. Uh, the sit-at-home strike will continue until we uh, receive our July salary. Of course, um, in some states, the uh, the the governments do everything they can uh, to 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 make the judiciary comfortable because um, you don't want you don't want anything going wrong there. You know what I mean. And of course, um, it affects the the generality of 
of society. Everybody, every sector who, you know, is able to go to court. If the gates of the courts are locked, the gates of the judiciary complex are locked, then it affects the entire society, including government. I'm sure that um, if the governor of your state had uh, a court case that was really important in terms of um, his political future or political destiny or something that affected him, these courts will be open. So let's see. The, the Oyoste governor is a proactive governor, quite a young man, you know, and um, relatively young compared to the other governors. And uh, I've seen him flying in Israel trying to look at uh, farms and everything to see whether he can import them to your state. So he seems to be a forward-thinking individual, and uh, I, I hopefully this would not uh, go beyond uh, 24 to 48 hours, like Abacha is said to have said. You know, anything that goes beyond 24, 48 hours, government is complicit. But not regarding this anyway, that's a security code. So let's see. Let's hopefully uh, this will, uh, will change. Let's quickly go to um, uh, Kaduna and look at the Kaduna Abuja uh, uh, hostage situation. The, uh, those who were kidnapped on the plane train that was uh, headed from Abuja to Kaduna in Kaduna State uh, some time ago, March 28, to be precise. Uh, the fourth batch of uh, released kidnappers have found their way back to uh, freedom. All right, this is the fourth batch. We had the first batch, second batch, the third batch. Recently, uh, after a video emerged of, uh, of the terrorists flogging uh, the kidnapped victims, and um, now the fifth batch has come out. You can see the gentleman five on your screen. The one to your extreme left, or to the extreme right, is a professor. His name is uh, Mustafa Rumba Imam, or you can call it uh, him Mustafa Imam. He's an associate professor um, in the Usman Danfodio um, University Teaching Hospital, all right, uh, and he uh, spoke. Uh, he is the one who, it was said, had a, a gun shot. He had a gunshot injury, and, um, you know, it, the news filtered out that he was wounded by a bullet, you know. So he's one of those that was released. He's sitting down. Um, he, looks, uh, he looks okay. All right, um, and you can see there's a logo at the background. That is the office of the Desert Herald. Now, the publisher of the Desert Herald, uh, Tukur Mamu, has been in talks with um, the, that he's the one in the middle there, okay? He's been in talks with the terrorists to try and negotiate on behalf of some families. You know, and um, he'd, uh, he'd, he'd spoken to the press before, saying, I'm talking to the terrorists to try and see how I can secure the release of... Uh, uh, some of our, our brothers and sisters who are in captivity. Um, so he is the one with them. Uh, it's not clear if any uh, of the, the victims, released the victims, paid money to secure their freedom. All right. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we see. The names of the gentlemen released are, like I said, Professor Mustafa Imam. Uh, he is an medical doctor, associate professor with the Usman Danfodio University uh, Teaching Hospital. Uh, we have um, Sok Akibu Lawal, Abubakar Ahmed, Rufai Mukhtar Shoaibu, and um, Sidi Aminu Sharif. These are those who, who were released. Of course, uh, so far, 37 victims uh, have regained their freedom. Uh, so far, 37 victims have regained their freedom uh, from the den of the kidnappers. And, uh, I mean, we hope that we'll have more of them being released. Uh, of course, details have emerged of the gentlemen um, or, and ladies and the youngsters who have been uh, in, in detention so far. Um, you know, he had some things to say. Uh, Professor Mustafa Imam had some things to say uh, about their experiences in detention. Um, you know, he said that he was a, a de facto doctor in the camp of a, uh, the, the terrorists, treat, treating the terrorists and even the the victims as well. He said one of the ladies there almost died because she had simple malaria and there was no drug to treat her. She went into coma. So as a medical doctor, he had to manage uh, the situation. It's very harrowing. Um, I don't know if we are ready to play that clip. Um, if we are, we'll listen to uh, to the doctor and what he said, you know, to the press, you know, at that office of the Desert Herald. Let's go there and listen to him. I am an associate professor of medical biochemistry with Usman Danfodio University Supreme. I am one of um, those that were abducted by Boko Haram on um, the 28th of March. I am on the train that left uh, Abuja to uh, Kaduna. The situation is really, really dire and terrible. Okay, uh, 
can you can you say about your experience? Yeah, please. My, my 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 experience is, is really terrible. I mean, you can see I I just finished shedding tears, tears tears of joy that I'm feeling. I mean, I I have returned back and I'm going to be reunited with my family uh, very very soon. Now, um, quite frankly, is not um, the experience I've been through um, the last four months is not something I would like even my enemy to go through because um, I mean there was in, there was barely food that, um, I mean for people to eat we were hungry for the last three three and a half months I mean we were quite surprised in the last two weeks they actually um, I mean they, they started bringing uh, a food stuff that um, we ate and we. We, we, we were actually okay in the last two weeks, but then for the first three and a half months, we were actually very, very, very hungry. And when, when I say very hungry, this is an understatement. I mean, we, there were days that we go, I mean, just eating once. We, we ate once in, in, on, on certain days. And um, you just imagine there are children that are barely one year, I mean, a child that is barely one year old and a 90 year old person feeding once a day. Just do the math. Just do the math. I mean, when, when you talk about medication, I literally was the, the medical doctor on camp. I was treating the captives as well as um, um, the bandits, or I would say Boko Haram, Boko Haram members. Um, there wasn't medication. To be very frank with you, I we, we had on, on the radio somebody was claiming that um, they would bring medication whenever, whenever yeah, it was needed. There, there wasn't any medication on camp. I mean, we could we could go days. There was a day that a particular lady who had malaria. So malaria, you could treat malaria with a with with, with one thousand naira. But this lady literally was going into coma because there wasn't. Interesting uh, development there, and of course, um, it's 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 funny to see that um, these uh, released kidnapped victims or kidnapped persons are uh, able to to give press statements. That video was shared by uh, Tukuru Mamu, the publisher of the Desert Herald. But um, it's interesting to note and to see that uh, they can, you know, give interviews and they can speak to the press and to the public and uh, tell what happened while they were in captivity and all that. And um, you don't see any, any activity around them. You don't see any, there's nothing. There's no, no police, no security, nobody uh, around. You know, I remember one of the, the episodes of kidnap uh, in, in Kaduna State where there were some students who were kidnapped in the Baptist High School. And uh, the parents you know, did all they could to get the children free. Now, when they were brought out, the security authorities or agencies that were present wanted to force fully take them to government house and the parents protested and said no and then they spoke to the press and said we were the ones who paid for them to be released and it seems that like now the the government of Kaduna state may have uh, you know given up because at least at, at that time they were interested in in you know being the face of all of this you know because of having an interaction with the families to say, okay, how are we going to go about it? Now the families are the ones, uh, you know, media organizations, publishers like the, the Desert Herald and Co are the ones who are presenting these people to the public. Where is the Kaduna State Government in all of this? Where is the federal government in all of this? Where are the security agencies in all of this? So is it that they, they get out, they go somewhere, they release a video with very important information, maybe some of it should not even be put out you know, it's just be handed over to the security agencies and then they can use that to do their work. They release this information, they speak to the press, and then they go home. They go home and they, I mean, they're on television, they're on radio, they're in the papers, they're on the internet, which is okay. But where is the government in all of this? It's a question to be asked. Where is the government in all of this? Has government also given up on rescuing these persons? I mean, the last gentleman who came out uh, said a lot give a harrowing account of what's going on there. And this gentleman who has come out is also giving a harrowing account of, of what's going on there. And he says that he wouldn't wish this on his enemy. We know those who are in captivity. These terrorists consistently release videos um, showing their location, showing where they, they, they are, and the, the kidnapped victims are, and not a single person, not even one, has been rescued by the government. It may be possible for the government to rescue, maybe not, because of uh, the circumstances and the safety of those who have been kidnapped. But at least, let, let, let us see something happening. I mean, the last 
sets that were released, you know, the man who came out, who was in the viral video, you know, who was looking so lean and malnourished. She said that the families had tried to go get them out and they were stopped by the government. You know, but this time they were able to find their way you know, behind the backs of the government. So, I mean, is this a lost cause? And some are asking, is it that the authorities do not know where these people are? If the families can communicate with them, you know, and can go meet them and, and pick up their, their relatives, if, if the, like the people like the, the publisher of the Desert Herald, Tukuru Mamu, can be in constant communication with these terrorists and negotiating with them, and if these individuals are coming up with, with, with the information, knowing where they are and how they moved and all that, you know, how, how impossible is it for the authorities, the intelligence community, the security agencies to track them, at least say we know where you are, we are watching them, we are tracking them, and we know what to do. For now, it seems like the government has, uh, has given up and is not interested, it seems, in securing the release of these, these individuals. You know, it, it's sad. I mean... Private citizens, private Nigerians who are not in government, who are not security, uh, in the security sector, have been able to use you know, geolocation devices and technology using the, the videos that have been put out to find and to point out exactly where these terrorists are. These are the people not in government, just with their phones, looking at the videos and using some uh, technology, some application software with the videos that have been released to say, hey, if you do this A, B, C, D, E, you can find and trace them. Lo and behold, the government can't even do that. It's a very sad situation. Let's move on and let's hope for the best. Uh, I think if you have a family member there, you need to see how you can, you can get money to pay the terrorists and uh, get them out. You know, and, and this fuels the, the conspiracy theory of some people in Nigeria that the government or uh, people in government or people in some positions of authority are complicit in all that is going on. You're left to make your mind up whether you believe those theories or not. Now, this is a very sensitive one because it involves a, a media practitioner. Um, but uh, yesterday, uh, I saw that um, uh, my colleague on another television station, Arise TV, uh, Rufai Yosini, was trending. And I said, uh, uh, which thing does Rufai do this time? Oh, who is he harassing today? And uh, it turns out that uh, he had an altercation with a uh, uh, police team, all right, when he was accosted while driving on a BRT lane, all right? The BRT lane is what you see, for those who are watching us not in Nigeria or in Lagos, is what you see on the Lagos highways. It's uh, reserved for the BRT. BRT is a bus rapid transport, and these are uh, public mass transit buses that are provided for uh, by the Lagos state government and are run by a government-owned company, all right, by a government-owned company or companies, because you have about two of them. Some, I think it's also uh, could be described as a public-private partnership. You want to call it that. Um, so these lanes are reserved, like you have in other countries, in Lagos, Nigeria's largest city, so that these buses can easily wait through the traffic, and they are the only ones allowed on those lanes. No other person, no individual, no government of authority, nobody has a right of way on those things. They are strictly reserved for the bus rapid transport teams. Um, so the, the policeman in Lagos said accosted and uh, uh, stopped Rufai Hussaini when he, he was seen uh, on a BRT lane, allegedly on a BRT lane, and uh, uh, a, an altercation or uh, a verbal altercation ensued between Rufai Hussaini, a popular uh, television presenter in Nigeria, and these, um, these police officers. Let's just listen. Uh, someone on at the scene took a video which has also gone viral. So let's listen uh, to what transpired and we'll be right back. I will call the government. I will call the government. Nonsense. I will call the government. I 
will call the government. I will call the government. Nonsense. So, you know, quite a number of people, especially on Twitter and Instagram and even Facebook, have been, uh, have been commenting on this and, you know, some saying, hey, uh, Rufai should be uh, uh, an example of, um, you know, morality, you're a journalist like myself, <laughs> and you are, you're found in this situation, you're found in this such a scenario it shouldn't be. Why are you on the BRT lane? Uh, I mean, if you want to look at some of the comments, uh, I'll read some of them. You know, some are saying, hey, Rufai should be arrested. He should be imprisoned. You know, he's a journalist. That's how they do. Um, some will say, no, that's how journalists do. You sit on television and then they, uh, they blast government, they blast of authorities. They talk as if they are, uh, they are holier than thou. Look at, look at him. You know, and all that and all that is what some people were saying, uh, you know, uh, uh, some board body sharing uh, some quotes by Charlie Boy and all that. Uh, you know, he was head saying he'll call the governor, he'll call the governor. And some people saying, you know, if you don't know the governor, then you are in trouble. Some saying Rufai ran to Twitter for sympathy from deadly lions and he was cooked like a father, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Some people uh, saying that, oh, those who are criticizing him, uh, uh, members of a particular political party because um, he's always criticizing uh, the government or he's, he, he seemed to be, you know, asking the hard questions. Let's call it that. I think that's the best way uh, to put it, you know, and a lot of other things like that that were, uh, that were, were put out. So anyway, Rufai, Rufai was taken to court. I mean, you can, you can hear him on the video uh, saying that uh, he'll call the governor, he'll call the governor, I'll call the governor. You know, so people are saying, I mean, does it mean that uh, we who do not know the governor, you're better than us? Why should you say that? Are you not uh, uh, also a human being, a Nigerian like us, who should be held uh, accountable under the law? Remember when um, Fasha, the current minister of works and housing, was uh, governor of Lagos State. He had one time or the other stopped the security operators from using the BRT, arrested them. Especially, I remember one uh, customs officer who was stopped and arrested by uh, uh, governor, the then governor Fashola, who was the one who started these uh, BRT, uh, these BRT lanes. All right. Um, so people are saying you broke traffic rules, uh, you should be punished. And indeed, indeed, uh, I, I think a, a popular Twitter user, Depot, uh, is known, called, known as Ogbeni Depot, said that Rufai is just uh, embarrassing himself. I've had points on my license. I've had to attend courses to avoid getting a point. It doesn't, is that in Nigeria or Benio or some other country? It says, I've paid several bus lane tickets. Does that make you a criminal? This pretentious and sainthood attitude for social media uh, is just uh, lacking. Uh, another person, Maurice Moye, who is also popular on Twitter, said, oh, APC coming after Rufai because of traffic offenses is laughable. He admitted to breaking the traffic law, will pay all necessary fines, and that's that. All right, and the fine is just a 70K. Indeed, Indeed, yes, indeed, the fine is 70K because Rufai uh, was taken to court yesterday. He was taken to court. Uh, he was found guilty of contravening the Lagos State uh, Transportation Law 2018, and he was subsequently fined the statutory 70,000 naira. He made the payment immediately after which his vehicle uh, was released to him, after which his vehicle uh, was uh, released to him. All right, and uh, he is... He's been able to put up a, a sort of an explanation, uh, you know, as to why he he uh, he he broke the traffic law and drove on the BRT lane. All right, he was uh, on Twitter and Instagram put out a video uh, saying that uh, uh, he he there was a traffic diversion. All right, but I also want to quote him. You know, it's better quote him. He said, "Quote uh, during a Twitter live, I think a Twitter live video." Uh, I said I will call the government and I have the right to say I will call the governor of a state because he is the chief uh, security officer. That's what Rufai said. He said, quote, if I didn't feel treated otherwise, I have a right to say that. The only part I apologize for was when I used expect expletives. He said, um, bastards. He said, I apologize for calling them bastards. But I will call the governor. I have every right to say that. He said uh, also in that uh, live video that the circulating video did not capture where his car was forcefully taken away from him uh, by the police. Uh, Rufai said that uh, the incident happened after the incident happened. Rather, Some police officers followed him to the BRT lane where his car 
was stopped uh, because me and the police official went, he said, this is what I'm quoting him now, he says, because me and the police officials uh, went through the place where the BRT lane incident happened. And when we got there today, he confirmed that there was supposed to be a diversion around them. He said there was supposed to be a diversion around them. And I showed him where the thing happened. He also said that before he made a settlement with the police uh, on Tuesday, and on Monday, the police pointed a gun at him and forcefully took his car away. So that wasn't captured in the video. He says, and I kept on asking, where are they taking my car to? None of them talked. I kept asking, where are they taking my car to? None of them talked. So he said the car belongs to his friend, and he called him to explain. I called my friend, and he sent some police escorts to come and pick me, uh, Rufai said. Uh, that he also went on to say that uh, by the time the escort had came, that he, Rufai, had been brutalized uh, by the police. He says, my car has been forcibly taken from me. I was upset. I did not go to the police officer because he had thrown uh, some tantrums and said I should do my worst. Uh, he said, then I said I will call the governor and I have the right to say I will call the governor of a state because he is the chief uh, security officer. So Rufai, number one, given reasons why he said he will call the governor. Number two, explained that uh, there seemed to be a diversion, all right, in that area. Number three, saying that there were some, some parts of the incident that were not captured in video, uh, that a gun was, gun was pointed at him. He also said his car, his friend's vehicle was forcefully uh, taken from him. All right, that's what he said. Uh, and number four, he apologized for the use of the words, but he said that uh, he will not, um, you know, uh, back down on saying he called the governor because the governor is his chief security officer. All right, so it seems like there's some part of this episode that uh, was not captured on video, um, maybe an altercation, all right, and of course the, uh, the pointing of the gun at Rufai. I, I know Rufai is a logical human being. It's not somebody who is... Uh, uh, doesn't uh, act irrationally, otherwise he wouldn't be in a position he is. And uh, when I first saw this, I said, what could have happened, you know, to, to make this man this angry? Because I personally have been in a similar situation uh, before. What personally, uh, what could have happened to make this man act like this? And so he's given his side of the story. He said that uh, there was a diversion around the area. Um, and then when the policemen accosted him, they didn't treat him well. Uh, he said he was brutalized, a gun was pointed at him, and they forcibly took his car, and that's why he said he'll call the governor. Uh, but he has apologized for calling them bastards and uh, using the words nonsense and all that. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's that. But, of course, it's been turned to a political issue on Twitter. <laughs> yes. Someone say, no, because of his, his hard stance, you know, the style of journalism that he practices, holding government to account and all that, which is his constitutional duty. Maybe the APC folks are going after him and criticizing him on Twitter and while some are coming to his rescue. You know, but, but this is purely uh, an apolitical issue. You know the excesses of our police officers. We know that also, you know, meant to be in a BRT lane. Now, is having a diversion enough? All right, for you to be on the BRT lane, but others using that lane as well. You can see in the video some of the cars were moving. Uh, you can see them moving there. So what was going on? However, personally, before I can, I can jump to conclusion, I'll need to talk to Rufai, all right, and also to the people there. But he has said that he didn't do this intentionally. There seemed to be some diversion around there. And I think that's that. It's, uh, it's uh, another interesting occurrence in a social space. It's got people talking. I think it's over with the man at speed. He's fine. He's apologized. And uh, we can move on. We can move on. All right. My name is Kofi Bartels. Uh, we have to take a pause at this time. We'll return to look at what the papers are saying today. We have our guest standing by. Please stay with us. <laughs>